Uh, I'd like to say it's a pleasure to be here at the university uh, and a real privilege to be speaking in a room named after such a great man. Uh, also to thank the, thank the embassy for facilitating this. I, I would stress that the, uh, the institute I work for is entirely independent of the Irish government. Uh, anything I say here has absolutely nothing to do with the Irish government and I think some things I might say would not particularly please the Irish government. Uh, but let just, just to stress that the think tank is, is not uh, party political, uh, it has no corporate view on anything. We don't actually take a collective view on things. So we're a little like a classic American think tank in that, in that regard. Okay. Um, Two things, discuss Ireland and then discuss the wider European political and economic context. Start with Ireland. I'm, I'm looking around and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that there, most people here are not Irish and given that Ireland's a small country, I'm going to assume that people uh, know very little. When I worked at The Economist, one of the first things they said was, assume the reader is as intelligent as he, and she, as he or she is ignorant. So complete ignorance, but very intelligent. So people can pick up on things quickly. And it's, a good, uh, it's always a good way of, of presenting things, particularly to an audience like this. So let me start with, uh, with Ireland. Let me talk about a little bit of background. Um, Long-term performance of the Irish economy. Economists tend to use output as a measure of economic performance. That's the favored GDP. So the, the classic way we have of looking at economic performance is how GDP changes over time. Now, historically, the, data for the, the GDP data for any country are not very good. Some economic historians have constructed uh, estimates of GDP going all the way back to the time of Jesus Christ. But really, even today, we can't measure GDP very well, and we see that it changes, and some countries revise their figures a lot, and it changes a lot. So GDP is a useful measure, but one, it's uh, very unreliable historically. So what's the second big measure economists use to look at economic performance? Employment. So output, employment. Now, we have much better data on employment. And certainly in Ireland, we really have no GDP data before a few decades ago. So one way of looking at performance is to look at the numbers of people employed. So if you go back and look at the census data, you can find very accurate figures on this. So Ireland became independent in the 1920s. Now this next figure shows how the pattern of employment has changed over almost a century, and I think it gives a very good, broad picture of how uh, Ireland, a small economy, has performed over that time, and it is very unusual. So what do we see? We see for the first 30 or 40 years, uh, employment didn't grow at all. Now given that this was a period of uh, the Great Depression, for example, and the Second World War, maybe that wasn't such a bad performance. But what's very interesting is in the 1950s, employment collapsed. Now this is a time when the rest of Europe was enjoying a huge post-war reconstruction boom. And then for decades, there was really no change in employment over time. Now we have good numbers from the OECD where we can compare employment. This period here in Ireland from the 50s until the late 1980s was the worst performance of any OECD country. No other OECD country grew employment in their economies by less than Ireland. So this was a really bad performance. But then things turned around very suddenly. And in this period here, between the early 1990s and 2008, Ireland went from being the slowest growing in employment terms to the fastest growing in employment terms in the OECD. So to go from the very bottom of the league table for three or four decades to the very top of the league table for two decades is really quite clearly a very unusual performance. So we may get into that. If there are any questions on that, we, we, uh, I'm happy to take them. OK, so let's move on. Peter very kindly mentioned that the recovery in the Irish economy, it had a very, very big bubble, very similar to Spain, very construction credit bank lending focused up until 2007, 2008. Both countries very similar developments in terms of their employment, output, credit growth, 
and then, and property prices, and then it all came to an end, and their economies had a, both had very bad crashes. So how has the economy recovered since that very, very deep uh, crash? Peter mentioned that in one year alone, the economy contracted by more than 7%. So I'll go through a whole series of indicators just looking at the way the economy has performed quite quickly. I'm not going to stay. It's maybe a little more detailed than, than people here uh, would have an interest in. Again, if there are any questions afterwards, please feel free. Or if anything's not clear while I'm speaking, feel free to put up your hand and, and interrupt me and ask a question. So, if we look at employment over the past four years, we see something, again, very unusual. The Irish labor market is, uh, is something very, uh, we economists have difficulty predicting because it does very strange things. So as you can see, in 2010, 11, the collapse in employment continued. The biggest decline happened in 2008, 2009, but then very suddenly, which is unusual for labor markets, labor markets tend to turn around quite slowly, very suddenly, we had a V-shaped recovery in employment. So this is one of the best signs, both in terms of an indicator of the health of the Irish economy and also in terms of the human level. More employment is one of the best things you want in a recovery. So this has been a very positive change. The next slide looks at the number of people who receive unemployment benefit. And the numbers of people receiving welfare has been declining at an accelerating pace. So that's another good sign. So you can see every month more and more people stop receiving money for unemployment benefit because they found a job, they've started a business, they may have emigrated, uh, they may have gone back to university or to study, to train, but the trend is very good and it's accelerating. Now let's quickly just look at the different sectors of an economy. In an economy like ours, the biggest part of the economy is the services sector. A few centuries ago, it was agriculture, then it became industry, but now, in all developed economies, the services sector is really by far the biggest. It's between maybe 60 or 80 percent, depending on the economy. So let's look at what's happened in the services sector in Ireland over the past five years. So we could see that in 2009, the economy was still in contraction. But since then, it started growing, and it, there were periods where it really plateaued. But we see last year the sharpest acceleration in services output since the recession. So this is a, another sign that the momentum in the economy is gathering pace. Manufacturing, again, very important uh, in all economies still. Uh, it's particularly important in the Irish economy, mostly because we have a very big multinational, mostly American, sector. But this is the homegrown, the indigenous manufacturing sector, which is important, particularly important for employment, because it's very much more labor intensive than the, than the American multinational sector. So again, we see a period of not some recovery in 2010, not much recovery then, but more recently, a very sharp recovery. So again, manufacturing output is showing an accelerating rate of growth. So more positive signs from the manufacturing sector. Agriculture, still important in Ireland, uh, but much, much smaller than the other sectors, as, 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 as is normal. Here, the, this, is, this is the exports of the agricultural sector. And as we see, not an acceleration more recently, but a very steady, positive trend. And finally, construction. And this, this Next graphic shows the bubble period when the economy went completely crazy building houses mostly, but other things as well. Uh, so this is over 10 years, a little more maybe, 15 years. So we see th this is, that even looks like a bubble. It's completely crazy. So this is, the economy went crazy at this point, and then this massive decrease in, out in output. But what do we see? Recently, some increase from a very, very low level. So the even the construction sector, which was the real weak point in the economy, is beginning to come back. So we, we sort of hope that it would normalize somewhere around that level. So if it does, you can see clearly there's, there's scope for a lot more growth in that industry to bring it back to kind of normal levels. Okay, GDP, GNP. In Ireland, this is a particularly compl complicated question because the size of that multinational sector, 
For example, 90% of Irish exports are accounted for by foreign companies. Now, that's completely unique in the OECD world. There is no other economy that is even remotely close to that. So it's a very unusual economy in the role multinational non-Irish companies play in the economy. And that has an effect on the GDP, GNP numbers in lots of different ways. So that's why, rather than talking about GDP first, I tend to talk about it at the end. We look at the other factors. But this takes GDP and some of its components from the beginning of 2008, end of 2007, the very peak. So what do we see? We see a couple of different things. We see GDP, GNP. That's, sorry, that's 15%, 10%. So we see a decline of between 10 and 15% from the peak to the trough here in GDP and GNP, and a gradual recovery becoming more stronger, becoming stronger at this point. Domestic demand, much bigger decline. Why? Because the export sector was much stronger. So the export sector was an engine for growth, and it boosted the entire economy. Now, just one thing. Last week, you may have seen um, that the Irish economy became the fastest growing in the European Union of 28 member states. Now, that it's certainly true that it's one of the fastest growing, but can you see this sudden increase in exports here? This, not all of this is real. Okay, this is part of the complicated way that we, we account for exports in the official figures, but without going into the technicalities, this exaggerates it very considerably. So if that was not there, our GDP growth would be much lower, and while the economy is doing well, and it's certainly one of the fastest growing in Europe, the headline figure that it grew by almost 5% last year is certainly an exaggeration. So I wouldn't work too much when you see the Irish economy fastest growing in Europe. I, wouldn't, I would certainly say that a lot of that uh, is, is, is related to technical factors which aren't actually um, really something people feel in the economy. Okay. So some of the weaknesses, uh, most of the things I've spoken about so far are the strengths in the Irish economy. Some of the weaknesses, uh, so f still in the, in the economy, one of the things is that wages and salaries haven't increased. So many people say, we, I don't feel this recovery. I hear the government say, we're the fastest growing economy in Europe. And people say, I don't feel richer. I feel poorer. I'm paying more tax. This is not good. So one reason is because the labor market, we still have an unemployment of around 10%. That means that there is not enough tightness in the labor market to boost wages. So here, what we see, private sector wages and salaries have been quite flat. But recently, I think we've seen the beginning of that, of a change there. So in the final three months of last year, they began, there was a, a, the sharpest rise since the recession. I think that's the beginning of a, a wider ranging recovery in, in wages and salaries. Let's look at something else, household debt. During that crazy period up to 2007, people borrowed. The banks threw money at people. Anybody who wanted money, there, how much do you want? And we see what happened. In 2002, all of the debt to all Irish households stood at about 70 billion euro. Within five years, it had tripled. And then it's gradually declining. Now, as we all know, it's much easier to borrow money than to pay it back. And this is going to be a much slower process than this crazy period here. And this will have a negative impact on the Irish economy for a long time to come. Another part is the banking system became very damaged during the, because of the, because it lent too much. And that is now preventing or damping, dampening a recovery. The next chart is a little complicated. It's lending by banks, new lending by banks to businesses. Services, construction, real estate here. So the, the important thing, and it goes back to 2010, the important thing is that when you add it all together, the trend is not growth. Okay, so the banking sector is actually lending less to businesses now than 2010. So there's a, a, still a problem with funding for businesses. Public debt grew hugely over a, a 40 
45-year period, we see how big suddenly uh, public debt skyrocketed when the recession came. And that, again, we'll have to pay taxes to pay that off for a long time to come, so easier to, to borrow than to pay back. True for governments, true for people. And that's just a little comparison of public debt levels in some, uh, some countries across the EU. And the common trend is that every government is now more in debt than it was before the crisis in 2007. OK. So moving to, will, will I just go on, or will we just, Please. just keep going? OK. So shifting to a wider European um, view. So clearly, Europe has a lot of problems. We all, we all know that. But one thing I think it's always important when you're analyzing something is you always need to look at the strengths and the weaknesses. When people analyze a strong economy or a strong company or a strong football team, they tend to focus on the things that are strong. And they don't focus on the weaknesses. And then when something goes wrong, everybody's surprised. And it's the same with a weak economy, a weak company, a weak football team, all focus on the negatives. And then if you ignore the positives, then you can sometimes be surprised when it, things change. So it's always important to say that there are positives in Europe. We have a lot of, lot of positive things here. Broadly, we have a lot of political stability compared to most other places in the world. Uh, the concerns about political extremism certainly exist. Uh, there are issues, but broadly, compared to the rest of the world, we're quite politically stable. Certainly compared to the rest of the world, the rule of law is stronger here. It's one of the reasons why Europe attracts more foreign direct investment than any other part of the world. Uh, human capital. Universities like this, uh, the percentage of young people who come out of university who have third level education is very high in Europe, so we have high levels of human capital. Physical capital as well. We need to invest more in infrastructure, certainly, but Getting around in Europe, uh, whether it's by train or plane, is, is, is good. In, and that is true for a lot, of, uh, a, lot, a lot of other aspects of physical capital compared to the rest of the world. Something we often don't stress enough. We have some great companies. In many ways, the European corporate sector is the most globalized in the world. And some of the economies, not all, but some economies in Europe are the most competitive, whether you look at measures by the World Economic Forum, the World Bank, the Economist Intelligence Unit, when they, they attempt to look at the most competitive economies by a range of measures, some, some European economies are at the very top consistently. So there are some, some, some very strong national economies. OK, we might focus more on the challenges and weaknesses because there are lots of them at the moment. Let's just illustrate how bad a period it's been for the European economy. This goes back to 2008, and it looks at GDP. Now, we see the US had a deep recession, and now is about 8% bigger than pre-crisis. We look at the UK, and it's just a little bit bigger now than it was before the crisis. But we look at the Eurozone, and we see things have been very bad. We did come out of the 2008-2009, uh, the, the Great Recession, but the Euro crisis has meant that there's really been no recovery. And this is, is very serious because our political systems are really based on growth. And without growth, we get bad political outcomes, we get bad financial outcomes, public debt becomes the dynamic with public debt, which I mentioned earlier, becomes much worse and it becomes more difficult. So a very serious growth situation in Europe. It's also very serious in the sense that there's a big diverg di divergence between, well, let's focus on the, on the four big Eurozone economies, France, Germany, Spain, and Italy. Together, they account for 80% of the Eurozone economy. So five of the 19 Eurozone economies count for 80%. So small countries like Ireland and other countries around your neighbors like Austria, really, we, we count for a very small proportion of the overall Eurozone economy. Now, let's look at those four economies and see how they've diverged. Again, the next slide is the same as the previous one. It takes 2008 as a start point. And what, what do we see? Well, we see France is much more like Germany, which I think surprises a lot of people. People tend to think of France as being more Southern European, but it's not. And it's one of the things that people understate. France has a lot of weaknesses, 
but people often understate the strengths of the French economy, and there are much more strengths than particularly the Anglophone media would, uh, would have you believe. Uh, now, as you see, the French recovery hasn't been very strong, but it's certainly, it's bigger than it was before the crisis, and closer, the performance has been closer to Germany, as, as, that, as that graphic makes very clear. Where the trouble is, uh, Spain and Italy. Now, as I say, Spain had a very big property bubble crash, so that accounts for its big dip there. Uh, the Euro crisis made it more difficult, but as you can see, it's beginning to, to come out of uh, out of recession, and many of the other indicators support that. So Spain really does, over the past year, has shown signs of turning around. The really bad performer here is Italy. Okay, now Italy had no bubble before the crisis, so it didn't have a crash. It was growing very, very slowly, hardly at all, before the crisis, and it had one of the deepest recessions, as you can see, uh, one of the weakest recoveries, and again, despite it not being needing a bailout, because it didn't have a shock, so to speak, as, as many of the peripheral countries had, but as you can see, it really is going nowhere. And this goes up to the third quarter of last year. The fourth quarter of last year, yet again, showed no signs of recovery in Italy. And this really goes back almost 20 years. In, in per capita terms, uh, Italians are poorer now than they were 20 years ago, which is an astounding uh, performance for any developed economy uh, over such a long period of time. So Italy is the really big problem in the Eurozone. It's, it's too big to fail, too big to bail, really, it's so big, uh, it's a G7 economy. Uh, if something goes wrong with Italy, the Eurozone is over, basically. But, okay, and here's my only chart that includes Hungary. It's not all Southern Europe. Uh, there tends to be a view that Northern Europe is economically strong and Southern Europe is weak. Well, no, if you actually look, again, so this chart includes every EU member state, plus Japan and the US, and it shows how their GDP has changed since the crisis. And I think some of these things will surprise you, okay? Let's start at the good. So Poland has been the star performer, really didn't have much recession and has grown at a kind of normal rate. Everyone else has grown at well below historical norms. We see the US here, which again, about 8% bigger than it was at the crisis. Now we see Germany, we hear Germany, strongest economy in Europe. Really? Okay, it only grew 4% since over six years. Go back the previous six years, when Germany was the sick man of Europe, it actually grew more rapidly. Okay, so Germany has had a good recovery, but let's not get carried away with this notion that Germany is some super strong economy. It has weaknesses. Again, that point that if economy is doing well, or relatively well, people forget about its weaknesses, and that's very much happened with Germany. So we look, Many countries have just about reached what the size of their, econo of, of, their um, of output at the, at, the, at the peak of the crisis. The EU and the Eurozone, on average, are smaller, as, as the previous graphic. Hungary is here, just around the average, little below. But here's what might surprise you, okay? Let's go start at this end. Greece, no surprise that Greece has had the biggest contraction. Okay, so we see Cyprus, Italy, Slovenia, Latvia, Portugal, okay, no surprise there. So, but between Portugal and Spain, who do we have? Finland. So Finland's had a really, really bad time. Past three years, has been, it's been in recession. So we think of Finland being this great Nordic economy. Well, it's, it's, Finland has had a really rough recession. Then, then we look at the next country is the Netherlands. Again, Netherlands are hugely indebted. The Dutch are the most indebted households in the world huge amount of debt, and that, that's one of the reasons it's weighing down their, their economy. The Danes are also very indebted. The Danes and the Dutch are the two most heavily indebted household sectors in the world. Again, that's had, that's had an issue for, the, oh, sorry, for, for them. So as you can see, it's a mixed picture. It's not a simple north-south thing. Many of the north, northern economies have had a tough time of it. We've all had a tough time of it, more or less, but it's, it's not as straightforward as north, strong, south, weak. Okay, and to, to put this in a bit of context as well, there is a debate in, in the economics profession about why there's been a long-term slowdown in rates of growth. Even 
If we forget about the past seven years, we forget about Lehman Brothers and the crisis, let's look at what's happened over a longer period of time, and we look at a half century of GDP growth in Western Europe, the 15 developed economies, the 15 countries that were members of the EU uh, before you, you folks from Hungary joined, and what do we see? Okay, that goes back to the 1950s. So GDP growth has been slowing down. Uh, you know, Robert Gordon, uh, a great economist, uh, U.S. economist, uh, calls this the end of growth. He believes that growth is historically not a normal thing. We had 150 years of it, and now it's all over. So now we've got to get used to going back to what the world looked like for centuries, which is we didn't grow. Who knows? Uh, you know, there's a big debate going on about that. Okay. Uh, th this is interesting as well. It's not just Europe. Look, look at how the world, the growth in the world economy has decoupled from the, the, the G7. Now, this includes Japan and the US. So we see the trend in global growth has been slightly upwards. This goes back to the mid 80s. Slightly upwards, so the Chinas, the Indias, the, you know, the familiar story of the, of the developing economies accelerating in growth. But at the same time, we see the G7 economies uh, the big industrialized economy slowing down. And if we were to take the G7 out of this, we'd actually see a much greater divergence. If we took the G7 and the rest of the world, we'd see it considerably, they would, it would be growing more like this, while the industrial economy is going downhill. So there's a, there is a big question about whether we've come to a period, the develop, developed economies have come to a point where we're just not gonna grow that much anymore. So that comes up twice. So some of the immediate challenges for Europe, I've probably gone on more than I should. So let me just throw these out for discussion. Okay, Greece, Brexit not going away on the agenda. Uh, issues around political stability in some countries, move to the left in the periphery, move to the right in some of the core countries. Uh, geopolitics, we'll just mention that very briefly below. Uh, deflation, quantitative easing, will it work, can it work? Uh, banking union other issues around the euro. The euro is clearly a currency that has not worked to date. Uh, what needs to be done to make it work? Uh, fiscal union, is that part of it? Profit tax, one particularly controversial issue for Ireland. Um, and TTIP, trade with the US, that's on the agenda. Where, where's that going? Something we're very concerned about in Ireland, and, and sometimes when we have British guests visiting the Institute, sometimes we are more concerned about Britain leaving than Britain, British people. Uh, because as a small country that's very closely linked to the UK, if they left, it would have a big effect on us. So there are issues that we see about free movement for Britain, uh, budget contributions has been something going back to Margaret Thatcher, uh, um, the rise of UKIP, this isolate, well, withdrawalist party. The, there's an issue about the dynamics within the political parties in Britain. I lived there for 10 years, and over that period, fewer and fewer people in, in either the Labour Party or the Conservative Party were pro-Europe. And then we see interest group dynamics. Uh, again, fewer people in business are pro-Europe and, and uh, there are issues around how that will play out if there's a referendum in Britain. My own sense is that the probability of Britain leaving if there's a referendum is 60% that they will leave. Um, okay, some longer term challenges make the Euro more uh, sustainable narrow those gaps between the north and the south. It's caused a lot of political poison in, in the EU. Franco-German relations are the worst they've been in the post-war period, and that makes Europe less stable. Uh, institutions, issues around how the ECB functions, about common foreign security policy, for example. Uh, building trust and legitimacy has declined in the EU in most countries, particularly the peripheral countries. Uh, and then very briefly, just the geopolitical challenges. It, things have changed a lot over the past couple of years. Libya has collapsed. It's a failed state. Uh, we've got more failed states here. Uh, Turkey has become much less pro-European and moved towards uh, a more authoritarian type of government. And we don't really need to say anything more about what's going on in Russia. So if, if we look at our whole neighborhood, there has been an arc of increased instability in the neighborhood. and it's not entirely clear that Europe is well prepared to deal with all of that. So I'll leave it there. Thank you.